and good evening, everyone. I'm Amira Gad, Head of Programs at Light Art Space, LAS. Thank you very much for tuning in and joining us live for this live panel inside Artist Libihini's World, End. And before I let her give us an introduction on her work and tell us what lies behind the title, End, this conversation that is hosted inside the world is currently on view at the Schering Stiftung in Berlin until this Sunday, May 1st. So if you haven't had the chance to go and visit the exhibition in person, in real life, you are get a chance to get a sneak peek and a view inside this new commission by LAS that um, Libby has created. LAS is an art foundation with Berlin as its home base. As a young institution with big dreams, we look to the future to develop our program, and that can include those technological innovations that will shape our society and life, and quantum computing seems to be one of them. LAS is committed to research and experimentation, and the focus on quantum computing responds to our future-centric approach. Heaney's work aligns very well with the overall mission of our foundation. She holds a PhD in quantum information science and an MA in art and science, and has been experimenting with quantum computing for several years. Only a handful of companies globally are developing quantum computers, and Libby Heaney is one of the first artists in the world to use this technology as a functioning artistic medium. Libby Heaney's work often investigates our seductive relationships with new technologies, as well as quantum computing. She incorporates AI and VR technologies using each of these tools to critically investigate how and who they empower and disempower. Before I hand over to Libby, I would like to also introduce our panelist, Ariane Cook. Ariane Cook is a British independent producer and curator and writer recognized internationally for her transdisciplinary work within the arts and science and technology, as well as creating new residency programs. Often cited as a world leader in the field of arts and science, Cook is best known for initiating and being the founder of Arts at CERN the first officially organized international arts program by the world's leading particle physics laboratory in Geneva. We're also joined by Anna Papa, a computer scientist who's received a number of prestigious grants and her field of research is quantum communication, computation and cryptography. Her research aims to bridge the gap between theory and experiments in order to maximally exploit the full potential of quantum information processing. She has worked extensively on delegated quantum computation, verification of quantum resources, and quantum network routing as necessary processes for wide-scale quantum computation, and is actively involved in the industrial application and exploitation of quantum technologies. Together, we hope to establish together um, the different ideas around quantum computing and how the quantum computing can have an impact on our life. On that note, I hand over to you, Libby, and it would be long, wonderful to hear more about your work and that's currently on view and that we're currently living in for this panel. Thanks, Amira, and thank you to the panelists and to everyone who um, is joining us online now and in the future watching my recording. So my work, ENT, is a work that's used quantum computer in part as its medium Ent is the title and it's a word that's waiting to be finished. In German, as the work sits first of all in Berlin, Ent is a prefix that means the start of an action or a separation. And that's where humanity really is with quantum computing right now. It really is an emergent technology. It hasn't kind of, it's not fully developed and we don't know what its societal or economic impacts will be. In English, the word Ent references words like entanglement, entropy, which are core for quantum computing, and also the word enter. You really enter this black box when you come into the work at Sharing Stiftung in Berlin, and enter is also return on a keyboard. So the plurality of endings in the title really embodies quantum physics, um, the, the, what that you'll hear about in this talk today. The work references um, the central panel of Hieronymus Bosch's famous triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights. 
in a sense that gives audiences a way into this sort of new sometimes difficult field and because that that work is so famous people really understand that this central panel is situated between heaven and hell i also wanted to reframe um concepts like hybridity which in god's you know in the religious times of bosch were very sinful these hybrid forms are really out of place but in quantum physics actually they are the core hybridity is the core of quantum so i wanted to give them a center stage and instead of humans that are naked and experiencing this carnal desire, as in Bosch's triptych, what we have now are the human people visiting the work, or our audience members who typically, because it's an immersive projection, are desiring new Instagram content. And we've had many recordings throughout the, throughout the show. So I'm being sort of critical of the, the position that the work sits, the fact that it's an immersive experience. So the work runs, while the work runs in the games engine Unreal, so it's generating the world's life in the space, elements of the work have been animated through quantum computing. Now, I don't own a quantum computer, so this was all done in advance and then embedded within this world. So what you'll see, you'll see these shape-shifting creatures that are here in the, the presentation today. Sometimes you'll see them emerging through us. And these have been generated using data from quantum. The animations are generated through data from quantum entanglement. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about this shortly. Other, other elements that have been animated with quantum computing are the landscapes, how they're shifting and breathing. And what audiences really encounter is this land in flux before it all collapses and becomes more like a hellscape. And I think I'll leave that introduction there and we can pick up on various elements as we go through this talk. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Libby. Um, not to start with just the bigger questions, but to start with the most complex one, I'd like to start um, by asking you all, what does thinking quantum in, mean in your respective practice? Um, Ariane, I would like to start with you, please. Um, yes, well, thinking quantum uh, thinks is, is almost feeling quantum, sensing quantum, really, for me. So Libby's work really shows that, how it's a multiplicity of entry points between the human and also the digital and how they blend and go together into kind of desiring machines, if you like, which is what Deleuze and Guattari talked about. But quantum also means, and I think it's important to point it out, it's an old, old concept, quantum. It's been, it was pre first really properly proposed in 1927 at the Solvay conference um, and the whole idea of uncertainty and kind of the fragility of any entity, any atom, any particle, anything. So much so that Schrodinger said in his famous essay, What is Life, that he basically said, I wouldn't be stable enough to even be here if there weren't millions and millions of quantum events happening in my body at this moment. Otherwise, I would dissolve into a dust of powder. And it was a really revolutionary thought which broke apart all the kind of classic Newtonian binary focused physics of its time and since then it's gone on to inspire many artists it inspired the breton the andre breton manifesto for surrealism for example um salvador dali was incredibly inspired by it and um, wrote a whole tract about it in antimatter angels and you can see a whole long thread of how quantum has inspired people and now, what with quantum physics, I mean, quantum computing having risen so highly in the last couple of years, I think it's really important to ask ourselves, why have we suddenly accepted quantum in our society? What is it about the fragility of that, this quantum universe where everything is up for grabs, where everything is fragile and changing? Why are we finally open to accepting this? It's not only because computers are, um, you know, engaging with quantum computing and qubits. It's something more going on in our society. Thank you. Anna, what does thinking quantum, quantum mean in your respective practice? So 
Um, I have to say that in general, we are trained to not think quantumly, right? So from our school years, even from uh, in the university years, there's a very, well, it's starting to get a increasingly popular in, um, in undergraduate studies, but there are still a lot of courses of um, um, computer science, um, uh, bachelor degrees, mathematics degrees that actually do not deal at all with, um, with quantum computing. Um, and there's still a discrepancy between what um, physicists learn about quantum physics, what computer scientists learn, what mathematicians learn. So in order to, um, to be able to do research in this field, you actually have to combine a lot of different uh, skills and methods from a lot of different fields. And this is really, really challenging for us. And it's really challenging to, um, to train people for this. It's challenging to um, train people to do research, but also to do um, um, to to, uh, to get jobs in the in the uh, growing um, uh, industry, um, so for me um, the, the the great challenge is basically to stop thinking in a deterministic way, to start uh, thinking much larger, and to try and grab things from wherever you can, tools from um, information theory, from um, network theory, from uh, a complexity theory, from all of these different fields, and trying to see how to uh, pose them in this new, uh, completely new framework of quantum uh, information theory. And as I said, this is very, very uh, challenging. Sometimes you uh, don't have the skills to do this. You have to to, to really go through uh, completely different um, uh, um, fields that you have don't have a training in, um, but it opens so uh, huge um, uh, avenues of, of research and uh, of new results coming that could provide breakthroughs in uh, um, developing, for example, new medicine or uh, optimization techniques or a lot of, um, of, of different things that we can wait for uh, in the next uh, years. Interestingly enough, it sounds like you're saying that quantum itself is uh, within even sciences is interdisciplinary and we have to find a new approach and a new methodology in order to be able to tackle the discipline that is uh, forming with quantum. Would you agree with that, Anna? <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, uh, as I said, there's very few places uh, at this, uh, even now that it's such a growing field that there's so much investment from um, uh, private companies from uh, from um, uh, the European Union, um, there's still very few places and very few universities that actually offer degrees that are um, uh, focused on quantum uh, computing. Um, so this is an effort that needs to be done globally, I think, in order to um, form the, the, the future generations of, of, uh, of students, of, uh, of uh, professionals, of uh, even of artists that can actually uh, use these uh, techniques in their in their fields to um, get in, to incorporate this, this new knowledge, right? Absolutely. Did you want to add something, Libby? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I suppose just the idea that there's a shortage of people out there and the resources are moving from public universities to private companies at the moment, it's precisely because there's not enough people trained in quantum. And then, of course, to allow others to join the area and the the sort of debate or to, to probe these new tools for, you know, it's, it's a very, very, it's, it's almost like there's a bottleneck and the, the idea of access and literacy is super, super important. I'd be curious to dive into more in this question of the promise of quantum um, and what 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 for you is the promise of quantum? Why is there such an attraction and an interest to it? I can speak of it, of course, on behalf of LES. We are interested in looking at quantum computing because we believe that it is a technological a technological innovation that will have an impact in our lives and our future. And look to artists such as Libihini, who are not only making use of the medium as a functioning kind of medium within the work, but it's also offering us an insight and a look and a window into the potential of what quantum, of what the quantum age can hold. So I guess I turn to you, Ariane and Anna and Libby, and to try and understand a bit better, what is the promise of quantum? What kind of um, future is it, um, is it uh, um, painting for us? <laughs> Yeah. 
who's going to go first on this one? It's such a big, big subject. I think it's about the breaking down of all the binary oppositions and breaking down all the silos which we've existed in uh, to an incredible uh, scale so that every single position has manifold infinite positions in time and space and time itself is constantly in flux and is in different manifolds as well. So when you look at that, the imagination for artists and the imaginative possibilities for artists are incredible. Mm -hmm. It takes you further. But then I would also argue that the imagination of artists is human beings' natural quantum ability. And we have our own quantum inbuilt machine, which takes us into all those different dimensions. So to a certain degree, how far is quantum actually a reflection of our imaginations, you could argue? That's yeah, how we, how we think. Thought. <laughs> what do you yeah. think, Libby? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like we do think in terms of, as artists, in terms of kind of we're, you know, we're juxtaposing concepts and bringing these strange worlds to life in a way that's very rich and with infinite possibility. I mean, for me, phenomena specifically like entanglement, really, you, you mentioned about the silos that we've been put within, Ariane. You know, the whole of Western history and, and is based around the individual. But when you start to entangle qubits in a quantum computer or particles in a lab, these individual entities really lose their own sense of individuality and they become, they join together in a particular kind of symbiosis where even if you try to retrieve the individual out by measuring the system, you destroy the system. So in some sense, you actually lose this idea of individuality in, in, in quantum. And I think that really, really, like you say, moves us beyond where we are now or where sort of Western history has been in such a radical sense. And, and it really leads us to new inter interconnected ways of being or understanding ourselves, but our relations to each other in the world. Um, I think there's more to say on that, but I, I mean, perhaps um, Anna wants to jump in and respond as well. Yes, I would also add to what you said that there is uh, this sense of uh, indeterminism in quantum mechanics that is was baffling basically scientists from what Ariane said from the beginning of uh, last century. Like uh, Einstein, even himself, could not. He thought that uh, the the whole theory was wrong. He could not believe that you know there is. Um, the, he basically said that God does not play dice. This means that. It, you don't he wouldn't believe that there are random effects that are happening in the in nature and that we cannot predict them with um, a good enough knowledge and this is i think a very good basis for 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 artists to 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 uh, to, to grasp on that they, they can use this non-determinism uh, this um idea that things can happen randomly can develop randomly without being able to actually predict them or or, or decide how how they will develop um, that, that, that can lead us to really unpredictable uh, results. And this also opens a lot of questions for, for example, free will. If there exists a free will in us as individuals, how do we uh, perceive uh, maybe um, um, uh, what manifests in front of us? Um, or if we are as well predetermined uh, entities or things are happening at random and we cannot make any decisions. So what is the connection between between it opens so many philosophical questions that artists can 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 deal with that it, it, i think that the possibilities are actually uh, huge um on this aspect interestingly enough it sounds to me that there is also a kind of a paradox that is a, a, that is embedded within it um but i also wondered if we could maybe take a little bit of a step back when it comes to describing what is this concept of entanglement within quantum computing this is a concept that i've only come across um, um through libihini and i've um, learned to understand uh, its uh, its importance within quantum computing and uh, of course i think it would also be good libby to hear about how you visualize and incorporate that within your actual work. But entanglement is, on the one hand, so we are dealing with a technology that is aiming and strives to be incredibly precise, that has a processing power that is incredibly powerful. But at the same time, it is so fragile. And it is also um, one where if one element um, is, is not aligned, all falls apart, it evaporates, it, it kind of, it breaks apart. And 
I, I'm all I'm interested in kind of hearing more. I guess we're offering our audiences a little bit of um, maybe a more scientific understanding of this concept of entanglement within quantum computing in maybe accessible terms. Who would like to try? <laughs> I think Anna should should start. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, Libby, you also have a, well, uh, a PhD in uh, quantum physics. Uh, so, um, yeah, you have a very good knowledge of the field. But um, there's um, specifically the, the term entanglement is used more and more in uh, in popular science as well, right? Not only in arts, but uh, it, it, I, I see it appearing in uh, TV series and comic books everywhere. So it, sometimes there's some misconceptions on what entanglement is, or I, I think it's quite an important um, uh, notion that people should should um, uh, should know about. So, what it basically means is that you can have uh, there can exist two systems that become entangled. So we perform some operation on them and kind of bind them together, and then we send them to two um, separate um, locations, very very far away, maybe to the far sides of the universe. And then we try and look at them. So we suppose that we have two observers in these two um, sides of the universe, and they look at these systems. Now, what happens is that the uh, the, the, the values that these systems um, uh, take are actually always the same. They either are, for example, all, both zero or they are both uh, one. So this means that they became binded together at the time of their creation. And then they, they didn't really decide how uh, they will act because this is something that actually quantum mechanics um, uh, overcomes. Um, it basically tells us that this is not some predetermined value. They become separated and then somehow their outcomes are, um, are correlated. They are uh, always the same. And this is something that we actually cannot really grasp with our human minds. Um, uh, our ideas of uh, what uh, the objects are, what are values, what are measurements, they are really classically determined. Our, our minds, I think, are, are built to think uh, classically, not quantumly. We can only understand this via the observations that we see in the systems. This is also experimentally verified, so we know that this is true. And we can only also treat it in a mathematical way. So we can describe it as a mathematical object, right? But it's very, very hard to grasp in our human minds. Shall I jump in there? Um, so that was a really good description. So, so I think it's important to say it's impossible to visualize entanglement. So um, Anna mentioned that we can represent it mathematically. And we know from the statistics from measurements in experiments that it exists. But even our models might not quite, they match, they predict reality very, very well. They've never been falsified, but is that how reality is really working? It could be something else that the model, you know, maybe there's another model that we don't know about that would be equally good. So, so what I've been doing with using um, IBM's quantum computers is working with entanglement. That was, as Anna mentioned, I have a background in entanglement. Um, so that was my first point of call when I thought about how to create some, some visuals. And Anna mentioned you have these two particles that can become entangled. Actually, there's probably, I, I don't want to say an infinite number of different types of entanglements, but there's a whole zoo of entanglement. So you can have entanglement between three or 15 or a million particles. And that's actually what they're trying to do with um, quantum computing. Instead of particles, they call them qubits or quantum bits, but essentially the underlying physics is, is a particle or some type of quasi part, like superconducting qubit or something. And so I've been working with different types of entanglement in the quantum computers. Um, different types of entanglement have different kind of patterns that you can get from them. So when you measure an entangled state, you destroy it, like we've already mentioned. This is sensitivity of matter. But if, if you make, because it's acting wave-like or these multiple possibilities are existing at once, if there's some sort of measurement, and that measurement doesn't need to be from a human, it could be from, you know, a, a, a heat particle or a vibration of the system, but the, the, the quantumness goes and we revert back to this Newtonian, Newtonian sort of reality or this Newtonian matter. So, so for my work, I've been creating multiple copies of the same entangled states inside the quantum computer, and for each copy, measuring it in a slightly different way. And each time I look, I get different numbers out. But these numbers have 
as you move around the object, you get slight variations. And then I'm able to use all of it, that sequence of numbers to process images in different ways, to reflect some of this multiplicity within the entanglement. So there's a lot, at the moment, there's a lot of um, like Python code as well as the quantum code. Uh, Python is a, a coding language. So there's a, there's a hybrid of a hybrid of quantum and, and digital, digital processing of the image but to reflect the multiplicity of, of, of the entanglement. And, and, and then I moved over to 3D and was experimenting with the same methods, but adding an extra dimension um, to the system. And maybe just to, um, while you're um, on the subject, Libby, it's also um, interesting to talk about this moment of collapse that you have within your work. Perhaps you can say a few words on that. Yeah, so, so obviously there's, um, Collapse is something that you'll hear quite often within quantum mechanics, that when a quantum system, which is in, it's either acting, you could think of it like a wave, one particle behaves as a wave, or in terms of qubits, all possible bit strings or all possible co options within the computer may exist at once. You have this multiplicity there, and that's very quantum. But we obviously don't experience that in the world around us. We, we you know, everything tends to have its fixed position and, is just in one state at once. Um, so how does how does that transition happen? And that happens through in one interpretation of quantum mechanics. It happens through measurement, and this this is called collapse. So when when something measures a quantum system that's in all possible all possibilities, it randomly with some patterns depending on the structure of a wave and the structure of what was going on, it randomly goes to one of those options. And that's a random the indeterminacy that Anna was mentioning when she said, God doesn't play dice, Einstein's quote. Um, but actually that randomness is at the heart of quantum physics. Um, there's, there's been no other explanation for it. So within my work, I've referenced this through a collapse of the, the immersive experience. At some point you'll see it, all possibilities, the, the work is ebbing and flowing and the quantum animations are showing kind of these, these possibilities. The colors are quite bright. It feels quite utopian in parts. And then at some point in the in installation, in two of the scenes, it randomly collapses. So there's a random time of air. And then the work, um, the forms fall under gravity. They stop being in flux, they stop being multiple and it becomes almost like a hellscape and metaphorically that's connected to maybe some of the dystopian possibilities of future quantum computers as well. But what type of societal collapse could they lead to? Because we have to remember that technologies, while people aspire to use them for good, they, they may also do harm as well and both of those aspects are at the heart of my work. And I'm um, thank you for that, Libby. And I'm also interested to connect this with the work and your experience that you've had, Ariane, because one of the larger questions that we are dealing with um, here that Libby and Anna have also been um, discussing is really the applications of science within the arts as well. How do we bridge science? Um, how do we bridge science with art? And how do we create a platform in order to um, um, uh, identify what are both risks or weaknesses of the uses of such technologies and how can we create an environment in which we can um, understand better the risks and the potentials of the, such technologies. Maybe you would like to tell us a little bit, Ariana, about the um, experiences that you've had, artists that you've um, worked with, and how do you really see this relationship between science and art? Does science need art? Does art need science? <laughs> And you will need to unmute and then it will be helpful. <laughs> uh, they both need each other and they're both uh, mutually entangled in each other as well and affecting and dialoguing with each other. So much so that, for example, if you look at um, Duchamp, even he poetically demonstrated the problem of measurements in his work, Three Standard Stoppages. Um, and that was 14 years before Werner Heisenberg articulated and formulated the idea of the quantum uncertainty principle. Um, so that shows you that artists can time travel and quantum leap and do the discoveries and imaginings 
even before <laughs> the scientists have done it. So that's what I mean about this mutual relationship. Um, I'm always very resistant to the word application, applying art to science. I resist it like mad um, because I think they're both twin souls. They're both uh, twin explorers and discoverers of the world and they both need each other. They just do it in different ways. They have different methodologies, different languages, different ways of speaking. Um, science often works with the language of maths, which is a higher language, for example. And the arts work with the senses, um, very much so. Um, so they really need each other because otherwise they would be, you'd have a very incomplete picture so for me, science can be the springboard of the imagination for artists, but equally, as I said, um, and, and for scientists, art can also be an inspiration in giving new ways of knowing and different ways of seeing the world because they're both phenomenologists. I mean, both artists and scientists are phenomenologists. They are completely obsessed with the phenomena and looking at it though often scientists will look at phenomena through technology. So there'd be one step removed while artists will be getting their hands dirty, messing around and using all their senses and engaging in that way. So that gives you a picture that there's no cut and dried rule, but there's a lot of counter transference or interaction as uh, Karen Barad the physicist turned philosopher calls it, where things interact with each other and change each other slightly and have conversations in different levels across time and space, just like Duchamp did way before Heisenberg even talked about the uncertainty principle. Beautiful, thank you. Anna, I wonder if you are also collaborating with artists in the work that you are currently doing. <laughs> No, this actually has not yet uh, happened. Um, yeah, but it's good to see that um, such things are happening because I, in from my um, uh, perspective, art is actually can act as a as a mediator between uh, scientists and the general public. So it can pass through uh, concepts and by experimenting. Um, um, through the, the, the concepts of quantum theory, for example, it can, um, let's say, uh, increase awareness, it can raise all these uh, questions that you um, uh, just uh, raised on, on um, risks of, um, of uh, applications of new technologies. And this is much easier to, uh, it's, I, I think it's more approachable if it, it happens through arts than if it happens, for example, through um, uh, philosophy of science, or uh, because, because these these um, uh, fields exist, but they are not that uh, accessible, I think. And arts is actually a very good means to um, uh, to raise very important questions, ethical questions, uh, questions of um, um, uh, that that are raised all the time uh, within uh, quantum computing and quantum communication, like security of communication, or um, um, how much power do we give to uh, to the industry or to governments or um, um, a, a other subjects, like for example, binarity or all of these. Yeah. And last time we. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, I, I think that's right about ethics and how artists can raise those ethical questions. And I think imagination is an ethical force, actually, and raises uh, issues regarding ethics. And that's because also artists come with their own experience of society um, outside the scientific society, um, and they have those kind of questions and I've always think of artists really as radical agents in the world um, yeah and I think that's also a good connection um, to your positioning Libby because uh, the the central panel that you chose as a reference for ENT is also a panel between heaven and hell there is also an element of um, which position are we? Will we lean towards the heavenly potentials of quantum computing or will we end up in this more kind of hell-like environment of what that future can look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think 
So before I retrained as an artist, I worked in quantum, I guess, information science, quantum physics, including my PhD for eight years. So it's fairly substantial amount of time. And talking, you know, Ariane was saying about how how artists really bring their experiences to their work. And I have to say at that time, there was very, very little critical discussion from within the community about the impacts of this very powerful new technology that, you know, people were really developing. And and it's, it's I think a lot of scientists think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my experience of so the people that I encountered, but it's kind of this very linear view of the world and progress the solutionism from an almost positivist position. There are exceptions, so I'm not I'm not trying to generalize everyone. So I think what art can do really well is because we're not constrained by funding or profit necessarily. Of course, art is art is intricately bound up with a market, but we do have have a voice that's kind of sitting outside other sectors, perhaps. Then we can ask these questions around ethics, like in my work, and I'm using affect and feeling and sensation to do that. And leaving kind of these discussions that, are, you know, are, are more didactic and we really want to unpack what's going on to this public program. Um, so I'm allowing audiences to really sense sense these things. And I think that's, given quantum computing so new, um, I think that's, a, for me at least, I was really happy to take that approach with this work and allow the discourses and the dialogues to build organically rather than sort of slamming audiences with loads of jargon that maybe you know, would be better left for a conversation like this. And Ariane, what would be um, your biggest advice to artists and institutions uh, who are working across disciplines and tackling such complex subjects? Um, my biggest advice is always to be brave, um, to explore to go further than anybody else goes to question uh to literally grapple with whatever you're doing um and really be yes kind of persevere and i often say to artists as well do not be afraid if you don't totally understand the science or don't totally understand the technology because you are coming with your own knowledge base as well and your own senses and that may take you somewhere completely different which is just as valid and understanding isn't necessarily the key to making great work and I would say that to institutions as well um, so because great work touches your soul uh, brings a kind of transcendence if you like uh, to your experience of the world. So you go outside in the world and you see it anew um, and it makes you, it challenges your perception. So those are my advices. Do, do not be, um, do not be cautious, always be brave and bold. Yeah. And Anna, what advice would you give to those working in the field, having participated in this panel with us and hearing different perspectives and voices on how quantum computing is spoken about and dealt with? And dealt with? You mean in the arts field? I mean in the science field, actually. <laughs> so um, you're basically asking what advice I would give to people in the science field, how to approach the arts or... Uh... Um, what would you wish the science field could um, incorporate more of? Let's say. Let's see. I would. Um, I think that what I would like to um, to see more is what uh, Libby actually hinted. Like this is a greater discussion of um, of the future in a more uh, societal, uh, like the more societal impact that it can have, because this is widely avoided at the at the moment, and they can definitely be. Um, I mean. We shouldn't demonize, of course, new technologies. It's the uh, contrary of what me as a scientist would like to to do, of course. But there are certain ethical um, uh, problems that we that should be addressed. Maybe not by, um, uh, let's say, um, natural scientists like myself, but maybe from uh, philosophers or sociologists or artists, of course, um, as well in this uh, in this panel. So I would 
really like to see these uh, these questions addressed in the future the, since the more and more quantum computing is uh, getting into the public uh, in the public sphere and the public discussion and the audience uh, uh, the more general audiences learn about it uh, more and um, what do you think is the one piece of information about quantum that we should all know about? <laughs> so I think the basic notions of uh, what Libby uh, mentioned um, um, are not they are not easy to grasp, but they are. Um, I think even for 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 artists or for people outside the field, it's quite nice to 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 know about like entanglement is a very important um uh, property that is completely non-classical uh, superposition which leads us to a uh, non-determinism is also something that is um at least we can think about it as flipping a, a coin that is completely random so we can um there are a few notions of quantum mechanics that people can learn about more, maybe even already in high school. And that could, um, of course, as Ariane said, it's not necessary to fully understand science in order to do, um, um, to do arts, but it's, uh, it's good to have at least a, a broad understanding of the notions and to be able to use at least the terms uh, almost correctly, let's say. <laughs> Well, I know I've certainly um, tried to um, use uh, the terminologies around quantum um, as accurately as possible and um, deal with these um, definitions. We are starting to um, take some questions as well from some of our viewers um, who are watching us live um, on YouTube. Um, so we will start to address uh, one of those questions. And one that just comes through is, um, is to you, Libby, what other projects do you have coming up and uh, where would people be able to see your work? <laughs> <laughs> so you can still see it in Berlin until Sunday. So if you are based in Berlin, I would uh, highly recommend going to Sharing Stiftung in Mitte um, to see the work there. But if you can't make it, then the work is traveling um, in its entirety to a gallery in East London called Arbeit Gallery. And there I'm making some additional works to, that will sit around the immersive projection to contextualize, to think about kind of quantum computing as an industry. And I'm using language in those video works directly lifted from a lot of the big tech companies and startups to kind of unpack how they're trying to sell their tools and how they sell the applications that you know like we've heard already about modeling materials from Anna and so on so how do they frame that and and what is the hype because there's quite a lot of hype around quantum computers given that there's not a full-scale quantum computer yet like that's quite there's a huge amount of public and private investment going into the field at the moment um in, you know the dominant narratives are like economic profit driven and security driven um by, and that leads to a lot of competition and so on so i'm unpacking that but then after the projection there's going to be a twist um i don't want to say too much about it as well but in a lot of my work so i use kind of merging and blurring and um deconstructing and reconstructing so there'll be some of that towards the end so it's kind of a spatial narrative around the space so you can come here um and then there's i've got other shows coming up later in the year but i think um i think that's okay for now <laughs> Um, and I think it's also maybe worth mentioning that um, the object that uh, viewers are seeing right now on the stream is a quantum computer. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the picture at the center of the screen is, um, I think it's based on one of IBM's quantum computers that, that hasn't been packed into the black casing yet. So the large, long object, it looks a bit like a deep sea diving suit or some weird old... I don't know, deep sea apparatus, um, that's kind of a fridge because to make quantum computers out of um, how IBM are doing, you have, you have to cool the qubits down really close to absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Um, so they pack it into this casing there and you can just see where the, um, the gap is. You've got the innards of the quantum computer there. So the actual quantum computers are just these small chips depending on the company, but you have this big apparatus, the gold apparatus that sits inside it to cool everything down. 
um, very cold to be able to make the sensitive measurements. You need to be able to do quantum computation. So you are looking into the work right now, one of the scenes from the work, yeah. Yeah. And it, it almost looks like a chandelier, these kind of golden tubes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, gold is very inert, so it's very stable, but also I feel there's some sort of marketing um, going on with how, how they've been designed because they look like these um, apparatus from the future and but slightly retro as well. Um, yeah, I did ask someone from IBM if they were designed for like marketing purposes and he kind of smiled and walked off. So I don't know if that's, a, don't know if that's yes or no. And is the reason why there is no fully fledged uh, quantum computer out there is because it's very difficult to create a managed and control environment? I'm going to say yes, but maybe we should pass it over to Anna to <laughs> this one as well. I would also say yes. <laughs> the problem is that basically it's it's quite hard to um, so the, the systems they go here very quickly and the, exactly because the, um, the, uh, the holding entanglement is very very tough. We do not have quantum memories. We cannot store information as we know as we store in classical information like our images on hard drives and whatever. Quantum memories do not exist, so you have to create the quantum states and directly measure them. Um, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of problems in the connections of, uh, for example, Libby um, uses the IBM quantum computers, it creates this entangled, entanglement between the different um, uh, sys small systems, the different qubits. This is actually quite hard to do and it's not uh, perfect. So scaling this up, making for so now IBM, I think, have something like 70 qubits, the maximum that they have, but scaling this up to 127, 120, okay. So, but scaling this up, like to a thousand or to two thousand or I don't know uh, it really requires uh, a huge amount of engineering that's at this point we hope that it's going to be um, uh, accessible in the next uh, years. We should say there's another option so there's a company working in Silicon Valley called PsyQuantum I'm like I'm not working for them I'm not advertising them but yeah. I, some of their staff sci head scientists work were at Imperial and Bristol so I've had contact with them before they moved out to the USA and and they're using photons so they're using particles of light and then you don't have the cooling problem you have other issues um, which I won't get into but um, because photons don't interact with each other so it's actually quite difficult to entangle them but they're aiming to come to market with the world's first full-scale quantum computer that's that's and so with a million qubits and um, so it's a very di it's a slightly different approach and rather than going through these noisy stages like IBM and Google they're taking a totally different avenue um, so let's see what see what happens in the next few years with them. Um, but in this world of um, the climate emergency, how much energy do these quantum computers actually use? So I've looked into this and it's a lot less than supercomputers, mm -hmm. um, especially once you start to get the quantum advantage. So this is when a full scale quantum computer exists and they can process certain algorithms much quicker than um, a digital computer can, but energy scales linearly. So even though the computational power shoots up, mm. um, the energy uses. So I'm not sure exactly how much one of these fridges um, takes at the moment, but it's still a lot better than these big data centers with these big servers, which kick out a lot of heat actually as well. So you need these cooling systems in place. Yeah. Mm, I was just thinking about it in the wider socio-political uh, mm -hmm. framework we exist and live in now. Absolutely. And, yeah. I'm thinking if everything is interconnected, then how far are these companies thinking about that impact on ecology? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I've been looking into this a little bit because um, I speak so much to people working at these companies. I have to be careful what I say. So I'm not. So basically some, so some, some uses could be to one use of quantum randomness could be to prop up with quantum cryptography or key distribution to prop up some of the really carbon intensive blockchains, for instance, to make them secure again, because at the moment they're, I believe, they're, I mean, Anna's an expert on this, but I believe they're like vulnerable to attack by a full scale quantum computer. So you could quantum proof them by using randomness. And obviously that's not desirable. We do not want to be propping up proof of work blockchains. There has been some quantum and climate change conferences, which I think is really interesting. So I met someone who was talking about how you can optimize the placement of solar panels 
um, you know, so they get the most light and so on. But on the other hand, quantum computing companies on their websites are optimizing, uh, suggesting that one of the advantages of quantum computers could be to optimize oil routes and oil drilling. So there's this very mixed field at the moment, and I don't think they're thinking far ahead at all. And that's something that I think is really important to raise, not just myself, but others should should take a look at this as well. I mean, it's also interesting to consider that quantum physical principles have um, uh, been used as ways for reflecting on topics uh, such as climate change and, of course, the kind of ecological um, uh, impact um, of those technologies is one that should not be underestimated. But I think that's also an interesting bridge maybe to um, Anna in terms of the work that you're doing with qu uh, quantum cryptography that um, Libby uh, just mentioned. And this is something that I was not familiar of um, before we spoke, could you tell us a little bit about quantum cryptography and how, how can this help us? Sure. Um, so quantum cryptography is basically, I guess, one of the um, first uh, fields where scientists have thought of using uh, quantum mechanics to uh, improve, let's say, what we do with purely classical means. So um, the first SATS protocol was uh, proposed in 1984, um, and it basically e examined how, uh, by using quantum states, we can secure our communication uh, such, in a, such a way that it's unbreakable, right? Uh, at, we have to uh, take a step back and think that all of our communication now is secured um, uh, based on problems that we think are hard to solve. Okay, so uh, now um, our communication over the internet, our emails are basically secured by um, usually RSA type algorithms, um, algorithms that are based on the assumption that uh, the computers that we have, even the supercomputers cannot solve um, a specific problem um, efficiently. And with the advent of quantum computers, we can actually solve this, um, um, uh, this problem. So, if, for example, a government um, would have a um, very powerful uh, quantum computer, they would be able to break down a currently uh, deployed crypto system. So our communication would not be uh, safe anymore. Uh, if we think that at this point it's actually safe, but this is a completely different uh, topic. Um, so um, what happens with the advent of quantum cryptography is that we can again, secure our uh, communication, but at this uh, time being based uh, on the uh, quantum laws and quantum mechanics um, being uh, true. So believing in the laws of quantum mechanics, we can secure our communication unconditionally this time. So this means that um, no um, uh, government or agents or um, any malicious uh, party would be able to uh, eavesdrop on our communication and uh, listen to what we say without being detected. Um, another uh, topic that I'm currently uh, working on, which is also very important for uh, future quantum net networks, is anonymity. So how can you um, anonymize your communication, right? How can you uh, protect people um, from uh, revealing their identities uh, when they are, for example, positioned in a, in a, a country that does not uh, allow free speech, for example? So these are all questions that can be addressed in quantum networks with quantum cryptography. Um, and I have to say that quantum crypto, in contrast with quantum computer, it, computing, is much more evolved. So there exist companies that actually uh, are selling systems that um, uh, do a quantum key distribution. Um, it's something that has been demonstrated uh, even with uh, satellites these days. Uh, China has uh, some uh, really big projects that are using satellite-based quantum key distribution. Um, so it's... I have to say that it's, um, and, and what Libby basically said before about Psi quantum with using photons for uh, computers, photons were mostly thought of as means for uh, communication beforehand. And uh, now it's actually great to see that there's a lot of um, research going into photon-based uh, quantum computers as well. Actually, a very basic question that we have from the audience that I think would also be a nice segue into ending this um, conversation, which is, if you're not familiar with quantum at all, what would you recommend and where should one start? <laughs> I would say definitely read Sch Schrodinger's What is Life. That is a great book and that'll get you kick-started, number one, step one. <laughs> Over to Libby and Anna. <laughs> Um, 
Can we go to Anna next? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I guess there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos that one can follow, right? I mean, if the, the, the person has some background on computer science or mathematics and they want to go into more of a quantum computing um, courses, there are very nice um, uh, courses by, for example, Umesh Bajirani in uh, edX. Um, he's a professor at Berkeley, so he starts like really smoothly. And I find his course, uh, his online course, extremely nice. Uh, there's a very nice book by Scott Aronson as well, and which also has a bit of a background and it might be a bit more challenging, but it's a really, really um, nice read. But I think that I would, uh, at this point, there's, uh, I, IBM is also a really nice place to experiment. So they have tutorials, you can go online, it's free, you create an account and then you can, you know, exploit all these, explore, uh, sorry, all these uh, topics of entanglement, uh, superposition, everything. Um, yeah, but I would probably start with a, a search on YouTube. Okay, so for, for artists, perhaps you could start with culture. Um, we've heard Ariane say like about Duchamp and, and um, Dali already, but and there's a lovely book written by about surrealism and modern art by someone at the call told, I think Gavin Parkinson. Yep, it's cool. and, yeah it's amazing and then there's there's other aspects so like for instance if you really want to just kick back and relax there's like bbc show devs on quantum computing and many worlds theory writers like uh, borges wrote uh, stories like the garden of forking paths which really explores kind of many worlds theory which is an interpretation of quantum physics where all of these options within a superposition or entanglement really exists through, through different realities, which is kind of mind bending, but lots of prominent scientists really, really believe this is the correct interpretation of quantum. And there's, there's many others like um, art critics such as James Elkins has written, um, I think it's called Six Stories Beyond or at the End of Representation. There's a whole chapter on quantum mechanics and images. There's, there's a whole rich, rich history there that I think for non-academics, non if you haven't got the maths training, but you can access through other reference points. And we've already mentioned like Karen Barad is this wonderful um, writer, physicist turned feminist philosopher and, and uh, her, her texts and, and YouTube videos of talks are really, really fantastic as well. So it depends which, which, which sort of access point you want, but there are plenty. Well, I just want to put a bid in for Paul Thomas's book, Quantum Art and Uncertainty. And that is brilliant at also really um, summarising some of the different um, qualities of quantum physics, like superposition, for example, or atomic spin, and then showing how it's gone into art. That's a really beautiful, extraordinary book. Thank you for all these great recommendations. The, it's a, we've uh, offered a wonderful um, reading list. I already got a chance to read some of them at your recommendations, Libby, and definitely watch Lev, uh, Devs as uh, when we first started talking about your show, it was almost my homework um, to be able to work on this show uh, with you. But I wanna open up to any final comments um, that you might have, Ariane, Anna, and Libby, before we um, say some final words and thank all our audiences and viewers. No. Um, Ariane. <laughs> no, no? Okay. I mean, for, for artists, so I, I think it's really important to open up quantum computing, quantum technologies for artists and other people willing to sort of enter the debate, not only around the ethics and but you know, as an artistic tool, um, I think what Anna suggested is like going into IBM's account quantum experience and setting up your free account and you can experiment with creating entanglement and and so on now i think it's it's, it's like the idea of literacy um and knowing through doing is quite important so i'd recommend doing that if you're interested in getting getting into the field yeah thank you so much um, well, on this note, um, thank you so much, everyone, for this uh, wonderful and very exciting conversation. I, again, learned so much about quantum, um, and I know there is much more to learn. 
Uh, and if you would like to find out more about Libby's work um, that's currently on view in Berlin and that will be on view in London later on, I also highly recommend you read the interview that she did with Kay Watson, which we published alongside her show, which is incredibly helpful in getting a better understanding and insight into Libby's uh, practice and thinking around quantum in general. I'm so grateful to Ariane and Anna for um, agreeing to participate in this live panel in this format, Inside Libby's World. It's been inspiring. Thank you so much. And as final words, I'd like to take a quote from um, the introduction from one of your interviews, Ariane, that was published online, which I think speaks beautifully to um, the, the ethos behind this panel, as well as Elias's program in general. And that's if science is the practical and magic is the spiritual, one might ponder on art as the soul, a means to transmute and disseminate the findings of any esoteric or obscure process, always entangled, but ever lessening the rift that separates them. Some practitioners have equal footing in either side. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to all our listeners and viewers. And uh, see you at the next LAS event. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.